pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's edition of the Original Strength Podcast. Got a very special show for you this week. We have Dr. John Berardi, the he's probably like a mega titan in the health and fitness industry. If you don't know who Dr. Berardi is, he is the co-founder of Precision Nutrition, which is it's it's like a university in and of itself. The the definitely the world's most foremost in, uh, place to get education in nutrition. Well, thousands of coaches go through that program. Uh, is it a, how many would you say go through it a year, John? Uh, there's about I'd say probably forty thousand coaches that'll go through the certification this year alone. That is amazing. That's phenomenal. Um, like I said, it's it's a university in and it of itself. It's uh, the place to go for nutrition. But John is also the author of Changemaker, Turn Your Passion for Health and Fitness into a Powerful Purpose in a Wildly Successful Career. So Changemaker, this is, this is really what I wanted to talk to you about. Can you just give us a quick synopsis of what Changemaker is? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I maybe want to talk about for a brief moment how it came to be. Um, yeah. You know, for years, I, I, as you mentioned, worked in the nutrition space through Precision Nutrition and, you know, publishing content and education and all that sort of thing. And, you know, this was my very first passion. And, you know, I, working with a lot of coaches over the years, you know, uh, it's probably, let's say, up up to date, 200,000 coaches have gone through the the certification program. And, you know, every article we publish on the site would get two, three million visitors. So we had a lot of touch points with coaches, you know. And the one thing that's so unique and special about people who are working in the health and fitness space is that they don't come here for the money. They don't come here because it's like a well-trodden path to career success. They come here simply for love and passion. You know what I mean? They come here because one of a host of sort of origin stories around, you know, either I grew up doing this stuff with my family, so it's a way that I've learned to connect with people and I feel good doing it, or uh, quite the opposite. I had no experience with health and fitness. I skipped all the gym classes and all that kind of a thing as a kid. Uh, and I, I either got a particular disease or was diagnosed with a disease or uh, got to a point in my life where I realized I need to make change, made that change, became passionate about this work and then came into the field. So there's all these coaches here for these wonderful reasons, uh, reasons that could be world changing. And um, they are struggling, though. The lion's share of them are just struggling because uh, passion alone does nothing for setting up a successful business, for ensuring a steady stream of clients, for even making sure that you're uh, working in the right area of the field. You know, uh, look, as an example, loads of people come in and presume the only path for them is becoming a coach. And uh, that is a humongous mistake because you might not be cut out for coaching by you know, personality demeanor. You could have a whole series of skills that could be brought to bear on this work that would be totally wasted, like either from a previous career or just by your nature, uh, if you try coaching. Uh, so, you know, after years of working at and with Precision Nutrition as a founder and leader at the company, uh, I ended up selling my stake in the company in 2017. So it's three years ago now. So I'm no longer an owner of Precision Nutrition. And it occurred to me that, you know, there was just this tremendous, like, number one, I've had a lot of success in this field. Uh, number two, a lot of it's been done very unconventionally. So there wasn't a path for me to just walk and follow. I had to invent some things along the way, you know, um, ways of being in the field. And so, you know, I feel like I'm credible. And then I see this huge gap in the training and education of people coming into the field or who've been here for quite a long time. And I felt like I could capture everything I've learned over the years to help them turn that passion into a purpose, into a career, a real career, not one that you just dabble in when you're young and then eventually you have to leave because you have to get a real job, you know, to support the family that you're going to grow or whatever the case may be. Um, 
not one that you'll do for a while, you know, until you realize it's a dead end or whatever, but a legitimate career, you know? So that's what the book is about. And, and it was a bit of a legacy project for me because I'm kind of in a mini retirement right now, you know, having sold my <laughs> company, I, I, I don't have to work. Um, so I'm just hanging, we have four young children. So we're, and this is COVID time. So we're homeschooling. We're, uh, this is primarily what I do now. I'm, you know, uh, I met a physician recently. I had to get a checkup cause I injured my bicep and, uh, and he was like, so what do you do for a living? And I was like, well, I'm the director of this really new, awesome school that I run with my wife for our four children, uh, called the Argo Academy. Um, <laughs> So that, that's what I do now. But it felt like, um, gosh, if I were to walk away from the field and, and not come back and not sort of share the things that I've learned about turning your passion into purpose, discovering your values um, and your unique abilities and how to use them to create a career, um, I'd be not being true to myself because I feel like I have a lot to share and, I, and I'd be leaving a big, huge hole in, in the industry. So that's really where the Changemaker book came from. And um, after the book was done, I sort of spun a company out of it called Changemaker Academy, um, yes. which I hired a really great, passionate young team to, to run. So I'm not really operationally involved in that either. Um, but yeah, it's just this idea of there's all these people out there who want to change the health of the world the fitness of the world. They want to get people moving. They want them to better orient to sleep and stress management and nutrition. And um, they're so on fire for it, it's exciting. But that isn't enough. That is like necessary, but not sufficient to be successful, you know? Right. And there's something more they have to learn there's, you know, how to create an educational path for yourself. There's some fundamentals of business, sales, marketing, organizational structure. If you're going to hire some people eventually, there's the fundamentals of coaching that you need to know. There's um, understanding the market. In other words, the people who could buy your stuff, you know, you have to understand what they want to buy, what they're willing to pay for. And then the most important thing is understanding yourself, understanding um, who you are is how I like to say it, you know? So if we draw a circle, you know, and it's Tim, you know, who is Tim? He has then no we have idea. To... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Very few of us will, will ever know, you know, uh, we can, uh, circle around the core truth of who we are, you know, but will we ever really know it's difficult because, um, we're always changing as well. Right. So it's like, um, you know, blindfolded, trying to shoot an arrow at a target. And all of a sudden you're put on a wheelie car and you're being moved back and forth and the targets being moved back and forth also. Right. That's what trying to know yourself is like. Um, so, but if you can get some sense of what your purpose is, your unique abilities and your values, at least as they stand today, and that becomes the circle of you. And then you understand what people want and are willing to pay for in the world. And you look for the overlap of those two circles. It's not going to be a perfect overlap, right? You, there's certainly things that you are great at and value that no one wants to buy. And then there's certainly things that people want to buy that you don't want to make or shouldn't make because you'd not be very good at it. So we have to find that layer where it's people want to buy, you know, what they want and when they want, they want to buy and what you can make that would be great and that you want to make. And if you can position yourself in that space right there, um, your probability of success just skyrockets. And how do we define success here? Well, we could define it as making money. So your probability of making money will skyrocket. But the other thing is having like a deep connection and meaning to the work, which is also another part of success. Like the, I don't think it's too audacious to ask of the world. I want to love what I do. I want to make great money doing it. And I want to feel meaning and value so that at the end of my life, when I die or retire or whatever it is, I can say that was worth having done. I don't think that's too audacious and ask, at least for people who could be listening to this podcast. You know what I mean? There's a huge right. swath of the world who th these types of things aren't uh, available to them, 
right? They were born in a country at civil war. They don't have any access to technology. Um, getting food is a struggle enough, you know? Um, but we're not talking to them right now, right? And people who have their headphones in and they're listening to our podcast and they have a device they can listen to it on are in that unique, small, tiny piece of the world that can be audacious enough to ask for what they want for that kind of contentment, you know, for that kind of purpose. And so I think that if we are gifted with that ability by accident of birth or maybe clever positioning on our part, but probably just accident of birth, um, it's a waste to not take advantage of it. You know, not, you know, like it, there's nothing worse than folks struggling when they have right. all the advantages to not struggle, you know, and the struggling is simply because they didn't understand the steps to take to figure out who they are, figure out what the world is like, put the two together to get what they want. So that's what the book helps to solve. So, and it struck me like, it's a, it's a great book. I, it is powerful. It, and it gave me a few epiphanies that I'll, I'll tell you about in a second, but awesome. it really though, it could be for any industry. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, I don't, I don't think, I mean, yes, it is pointed at the health and fitness industry, but this is a personal growth and development book. It's a, mm -hmm. uh, and you could take the skills learned in here and apply it towards any industry to help you find a, a wildly successful career. Yeah, I this think. is a, this is a major, um, challenge, I guess, during the creation of the book, because as I was writing it, I, I kept having that feeling over and over again, like, man, um, it, is this too pointed at the fitness industry? Uh, which as an author means that you cut off every other industry from buying it, right? It will be seen as a niche book for a niche industry. And, um, and so even my, uh, my publishing house was like, why don't we just make this a general business book? Like it'll sell so many more copies. And I don't necessarily believe that um, because uh, now all of a sudden you're sw swimming with the biggest sharks in the world, right? How do you right. get attention for a general business book when, you know, Ray Dalio, one of the top 10 wealthiest men in the world just wrote a business book, you know what I mean? So, um, so that's, well, that's one challenge. I don't know that it would necessarily sell more you know, when you drop it into the biggest, most competitive space. Uh, and then the second thing is, and the bigger reason for not doing it uh, that way, is that this is my industry and these are my people. You know what I mean? Like I wanted to write this book for my people. I, I, I started out in the field when I was 16 years old. You know, I uh, this is what I've been in all along. It's what I've always known. And these are my people that I want to help. So that's why it is a fitness industry book. But you're right. I mean, all the principles are universally applicable. I think it's really a book for how to live a good life. Yes, um, but for sure, I used all health and fitness industry examples. Um, and if folks work in a different industry, and many who do have picked up the book and said they use it in their field all the time, um, you just have to kind of squint your eyes and look past the examples. Uh, some of the examples, you know, and, and not all of them are fitness industry examples, as you know. But anyway, yeah, I think you're right. It's a principle book. You know, it, it's it's based on foundational principles of effective living, effective working. And uh, yeah, I just so happen to have lots of examples from the space that we work in. It's no, it's wonderfully done. And I think from a personal growth standpoint, it it is very powerful in that it can help a person discover their purpose. Mm -hmm. Like you, 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 you skillfully use questions to help dive down into like to get the person to ask the right question to start uncovering the layers of who they are. Mm -hmm. um, and then you use the values, like what are their core values? So I, I think it is because passion. So I, I just last week I interviewed a lady named Sarah Thomas. She's the first person in the world to swim the English Channel four times mm -hmm. nonstop. And she said that you have an obligation to yourself to pursue your passion. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was powerful. And, but a lot of people, like you said, in the fitness industry are full of passion, mm -hmm. but they don't know how to direct it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the, it, it, there's a continuation of that. I mean, it's a great motivational slogan and it's actually a, a truism, you know, to the point of becoming cliche, right? Uh, because it's true. However, it stops at a certain point without a strategy that passion is doomed to failure. You know what I mean? And that's what's so sad to me. It's, it, it was one of the reasons why I was so excited about doing this book is 
watching people's passion be eroded year after year of not being able to turn something meaningful out of it or from it. You know what I mean? That's sad. And I just seen it over and over again. People who come into this thing on fire, they want to change people's lives. They want to change the world. They want to do something that they feel so called to do. And that's great. But that like fired upness only lasts for a while. And when you can't pay the rent or you're earning well under what you deserve, the, the world starts to tell you that it's a fool's errand, right? right. And, and you start to believe that eventually. So the fire gradually diminishes and diminishes, right? Until it's just this little flicker. And, uh, and that's sad to me, right? Because it need not. Passion wasn't the problem. It's just no successful career comes from passion alone. You need strategies, you know? So it's not one greater than the other. It's both equally great. You know, it's kind of like asking the question, what's more important, Tim, the heart or the lungs? Yes. You know, like what, what, <laughs> you're like both, I think, you know, without either you're doomed. So passion is so critical to carry us through difficult times in our careers, to launch us into it with the excitement, enthusiasm needed to do the hard education that's required and learn the difficult lessons that are required. But we also need an educational plan, you know? Um, as I write about in the book, the T-shaped curriculum is the model I like to use. And it's this idea that you have to do an honest inventory of who you are and where you are today um, and what future you ought to know, right? It's what, where's the gap between current me and future me, right? Uh, people might look at my career and they have at times and be like, I wanna do what you did, right? And you're like, okay, cool. Um, we need to unpack that a bit more, right? Do you know what I actually have done? Do you know what my full path was? Maybe you ought to know that. Uh, number two, do you know what skills I have, right? That allow me to do the things that I'm doing, you know? Uh, if you don't, you should know them. And then you have to figure out how you can get those skills yourself, right? And that means educational plan. Right. And the T-shaped curriculum, if you imagine, as, as you know from the book, a horizontal bar is the top of the T and then the vertical bar is the line, the straight going down line in the T. And the horizontal bar represents all the things you will need to know, not at a deep mastery level, but things that you'll need to know to be proficient future you. And then the uh, vertical bar is the deep knowledge you'll need. Right. So, for example, in my case, you know, I have a Ph.D. in exercise and nutritional biochemistry. So that's my, you know, vertical line of the T. Right. I know science. I know supplementation. I know nutrition. I know movement. You know, I know research. That's my deep part of the T. But across the horizontal bar, you know, I've learned public speaking skills. I've learned writing skills. I've learned um, marketing and sales skills. You know, I've learned coaching skills, so change psychology and behavioral science. You know, these are all areas that I didn't need deep math. I don't need a PhD in, but I need to be competent in to be able to express and manifest the deep knowledge that I have. You know, um, I, I'm a huge literature buff and, and you know, have read all Hemingway stuff. And, uh, you know, he's a legendary figure for those who love American literature. But... He's often considered one of the benchmarks for the T-shaped person, right? So here was someone with like a very deep mastery of his craft and writing. But if you know anything about Hemingway, he was like a war correspondent and an adventurer and a boxer and a fisherman and connoisseur of wines and travel. Like he was super interesting because he had developed from young to, you know, full adulthood this interesting T-shaped learning model, right? Where he was going to have a shallow understanding of a lot of interesting things and then deep understanding of one thing. And to me, this is the path that you ought to be looking toward when you're either young in your career or either when you're senior in your career and um, still have to manifest more of that self that you want to manifest you still want to work towards a future where 
future you is better than current you. Um, so again, without that kind of educational strategy, mm, passion alone isn't going to get you there, right? And you need some skills, you know, you need to practice some things to get those skills, but what, what will you practice? And do you have a plan for that? Or are you just now nah, another course came up on my Facebook and, and I, maybe I'll go to that one. You know, um, I, I think we ought to be mapping out, you know, successful future you starting now and wherever now is, right? As the old adage says, like, when's the best time to plant a tree 20 years ago? When's the second best time today? So if you haven't done this before, it's okay. Just start it now. Write a T on a blank page while you're listening to us and start thinking about what future you would need to be able to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish in terms of skills. So that that's that's just part of it. And then there's obviously, you know, business, marketing, sales, organizational stuff, hiring stuff that you'll need to learn over time. Uh, and that's all strategy, right? It's all stuff you can learn. It's all skills you can develop. But if you're not thinking this way and you're just thinking like, I'm excited about this, um, that uh, is going to lower your probability of having meaning a meaningful career and and one that pays you well enough. Didn't you say in in your book that the turnover rate uh, for fitness professionals is forty percent a year? Yeah, roughly? the the that's the rate of all fitness professionals, you know. But it even gets scary when you look into places like uh, commercial gyms, which is where most people start out, right? So mm -hmm. if someone starts out as a personal trainer, for example, they'll start out at a uh, you know in in America like a lifetime. Uh, athletic club or a equinox or 24 hour fitness and the turnovers in places like that are over a hundred percent which is it's crazy you know um so and and you know no offense to them it's it's where most people try out training for the first time you know right. what i mean so you're getting a biased sample there so but i mean the statistics are just not good whether it's 40 percent industry as a whole 100 percent at a particular club chain um a lot of people who are really excited about this won't be here in a year. And that's because they had no plan. They had no map. They didn't know what direction they should be pointed in. And even if they thought they knew the direction, they didn't know how to learn the skills required to be successful in, in that place. So, um, yes, the statistics are sad. They need not be that. Um, and it's no fault of the individual, really. I mean, where, where are you going to get this education? You know, uh, most people who come into this field don't have a college degree in it. And most of the college degree programs don't teach you any of the real world stuff around <laughs> having a career. You know, you'll learn muscles and you'll learn movement and you'll learn biochemistry. And maybe you'll have one business class, maybe. Um, and so... Where are you going to learn it? You know, you got your personal training certification or your nutrition certification or whatever. Um, there, there's more to do, though. There's more to know. And and it's not super clear how to do that. So, again, that's what, you know, with the book and with the courses after the book that that we offer at the Academy, um, we're hoping to make an impact. And it's it's cool, though. I, it's really interesting. Um, the book is not out one year yet. And we are in six different universities now. Um, wow. So uh, the book is picked <laughs> up as the textbook for six different uh, fit, health and fitness uh, university curriculums, which is really cool. I never really expected that because it's not written as be, a textbook. You know what I mean? But that seems to be how you kind of operate, though. You 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 create curriculums that end up in universities. I think that's right. your. <laughs> Right. Never, never intending to. I mean, I, I, I'm a university uh, escapee. You know, I, I got out. I escaped. <laughs> um, you know, usually uh, when you go the Ph.D. route, you're being groomed to be a, a lifer, you know. And so uh, escaping that gravitational pull isn't always easy. And I did it. And now I'm being sucked back in by the tractor beam. I, I think that just speaks volumes to who you are. It's I would say that would just kind of put you up there as a master craftsman. You're mm -hmm. extremely good at what you do. Um, and you have obviously a way of delivering it where, yeah, let's let's put that in the university. Let's teach everybody how to do it. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. And, you know, this, this speaks to what I help 
to or I hope to help people uncover, you know, the um, you know, my particular unique abilities, which I list in the book, are usually around like communication. And so whether that be in written format, which has been what I've done a lot of my career, this is a newish format. You know, when a, when we started Precision Nutrition, uh, there wasn't even high speed internet. So this wouldn't have even been a possibility, you know, um, what we're doing here on a podcast or streaming video, which, you know, PN does a lot of now. Um, but communication, like being very deeply curious and interested in how things work and why they work that way, including people. Um, and then taking all that and communicating it in a way that folks can understand and do something with is, is been kind of one of my unique abilities over the years. Um, but that didn't come from nowhere is my point, right? Uh, I often say, if you want to increase your chances of success, you need to ride the horses in the direction they're already going. Don't mm. try and turn them around and make them go away. They don't want to go. Uh, a concrete example is when I was 18 years old, I was still living with my parents and I, I was up in my bedroom and I had a little desk set up and I was writing articles like with a pen and paper for the magazines that I read at the time. Now, I wasn't getting published in those magazines. This is all make pretend, you know, it was practice. But, yeah, it was practice. I was I was building a craft. Uh, I didn't even really know that's what I was doing. But the the point is the horses were riding in that direction. You know what I mean? So it's not a surprise that I'm uh, well known for writing a lot of things in the field. You know, I started doing it before it when I was still a high school student. You know what I mean? Before I even knew there was a field that I wanted to work in and that this was a way you could work in it. You know, I didn't know that writers got paid or what they got paid or any of those kind of things. It was just fun for me to do. So then it was like, okay, cool. This is what I've always been just drawn to. All right, how can I really get good at it then? So really intentionally go, you know, go after that craft. And so even as I worked as a coach and personal trainer, which I did to pay my way through all my schooling, um, that wasn't ever the end goal. That was just, you know, adjacent to what I was interested in. Right. Um, and it gave me fuel for the writing you know, because eventually I knew I would, this would be my thing, you know, I didn't know how or why. So that's what we explore in the book, like, not you trying to copy other people to be successful, but you deeply figuring out what you ought to do. You know, if, if folks look to me and say, oh, I want to be like that, and they try and copy me, the chance of them being successful is really, really low. There's already me, I'm already way better than they are, right? And people will see the facsimile that's happening. They'll see the copying, you know what I mean? So the, the, the chances are just too low, right? Yeah. Um, but, and, and because it's my unique ability. Like it, yes. was, it, was, it was born in me already, you know? It, it's, it's through no um, heroics of my own, you know what I mean? Like, I, my mom tells me I was reading before all the other kids, you know what I mean? So reading, writing, these kind of things are just, it, it's, it's not heroic me doing it. It's an accident of genetics and birth and environment or however we want to look at it. We have to figure out what your accidents were, you know what I mean? Right. Where you've had these proclivities all along. One of my favorite stories for this, and it it's probably mostly manufactured, but uh, whenever I'm down in the States, we generally spend a portion of the winter in the States. Um, I live in Canada, for those listening who, who don't know. Um, so we spend a portion of the year in the States. And whenever I'm down there, no matter what grocery store I go to, I can always find Dave's Killer Bread. I don't know if yes. you've seen <laughs> Dave's Bread, all right? And so for those who don't know, like, it's weird because there's all the normal breads, you know what I mean? And then there's Dave's, Dave's. right? Yeah, Dave <laughs> is like playing, he's got like a long, he's got long hair, he's got muscles, he's playing a guitar, like, you know what I mean? And so he's the only one like that on the shelves, right? And so the story I've invented, which is probably largely not true, but it suits, uh, it's a nice um, 
parable here, you know, is, um, you know, imagine there's Dave sitting out there and like Dave is virtually unemployable. You know what I mean? This guy walks in for a job interview. He's got big biceps and tight T-shirt and long hair. And he loves rock and roll music and lifting weights, you know, eating high protein foods or whatever. He's virtually unemployable. But, you know, Dave's sitting there, you know, in his crappy apartment thinking like, how, how do I bring all myself together, you know, to do something, to make some money and continue to enjoy my high protein foods, you know? And he's like, well, I, I'm good at baking. You know, I like eating high protein stuff. Uh, what if I just came up with like a really delicious high protein bread, you know? And so he comes up with this thing and he puts all of himself into it and then somehow it strikes and now he's everywhere, right? It's just this, like, who, who would, like, if Dave was doing what most people passionate about health and fitness do, he would try and go be a personal trainer mm-hmm. and there would be no Dave's killer bread. Instead, this rogue weirdo was like, I'm going to do bread that has protein in it because that's what me and my friends like. And I'm going to put myself and my guitar and my hair and my muscles on the cover, you know, and it worked out for him. So really, the, I'm not, again, don't try and be Dave because there's one already and he's going to be better than you most likely. What is your weird combination of things? You know, what things that you think could never work in this space that ought to work in this space or you can make work in this space? You know, I'll give a few more examples because I think this is so important. Um, You know, when I was transitioning out of precision nutrition work, uh, so was our co-founder, Phil. We started the company together. And the two big roles left in the company that we had been filling uh, that we hadn't hired out yet were one of my roles, editor-in-chief, and one of his roles, director of product. So he oversaw our digital products and, and things like that, especially the software. So we started looking for who we could hire to take our places here. And we ended up you know, doing a broad job search and got a lot of great candidates. And it turns out the people that we found were making tons of money uh, at, in their other roles doing this weird hybrid of things, right? So the editor in chief is someone passionate about health and fitness, just like you and I are, who got really good at writing and got really good at journalism and got really good at publishing information on health and fitness to the point where he was running a whole book division at Rodale, one of the biggest publishers in the world, and you know, making half a million dollars a year plus doing that work, right? Now on the product side, we're looking at candidates and other individuals as passionate about health and fitness as you and I, but also deeply interested in programming, coding, product, design thinking, user experience, right? And so here, bringing both of those things to bear, which you, you usually think don't fit. I either have to go into product or coding and, or I go into fitness. Well, this guy was like, no, I don't have to make that choice. How do I do both? And ended up making three quarters of a million dollars a year in their last job, leading product teams, building products for health and fitness, right? So there's all these paths where you can use your whole self. Um, you just have to have the courage to try and figure out what that is and not slip so easily into what is, what's the role everyone's doing when they like fitness? Oh, personal trainer, nutrition coach. I'll go do that. You know, um, I talk about in the book, the one uh, woman uh, who's a friend of mine who um, applied for years to get a coaching job at Precision Nutrition right? She was uh, a special project manager for Bill Gates when he was leading Microsoft, just at the top of her field, right? Had a personally transformative experience with health and fitness. It wasn't important to her before. Some stuff happened. It became important. Decided she was going to leave the stressful job and the corporate stuff and go work for this company that helped her transform. Um, Our HR team never hired her. Right now, this was a master of the universe, ass kicking woman, right? Like 
she she met with Bill Gates on a regular basis when he was the top of the you know uh, computer company food chain. Uh, she obviously she was like, what the hell's going on here, right? Um, and the thing is, you know, at PN we do a lot of deep assessments. So everything in the book around purpose, values, unique abilities is not just theoretical. Like it's what we did with our team. It's how we hire. It's how we put people in the right roles. And uh, and so she was just deemed to never be a good fit for coaching, right? Um, and what ended up happening was she ended up getting a job with a friend of mine who runs another very awesome health and fitness company as her, and she's the CEO and founder, um, as her special project manager, right? So she landed where she ought to have landed, right? She tried to leave a company whose values she didn't share, who wasn't in alignment with her new purpose, um, and not use her unique abilities, right? That's what she, she's like, I'm leaving that purpose. I'm going to go to a company that has my purpose and my values. But, you know, whatever, it's not really my unique abilities, but that's okay. Um, and it, it didn't work out. She, we, she didn't get hired there. And I'm glad she learned this lesson because now she can go do her unique ability stuff in a company that shares her values and purpose. You see what I mean? Yeah. So I just, I have so many examples of this. And, you know, if I can talk some people who are listening out from becoming personal trainers because it's not a good fit for them, that's what I want to do. Um, if, if it is a good fit, I want you to do that work. You know what I mean? But you won't really know until you do these kind of deep dives. You, you mentioned something, and this is kind of similar along those veins, um, not just about doing kind of almost not assuming that you need to do roles because you think you have to as well. You, you right. had a story about you created this company, but you were kind of miserable trying to do management or be an executive or, or be the leader yeah. of the company because you were really good at writing and creating and coming, you know, the stuff you love to do, you weren't necessarily allowed to do because you were in, you thought you had to be in a different role. Yeah. And I just want to thank you for that because for me, it was like a, an epiphany because I love writing. I love creating pro uh, products and projects. I love like just the whole creative side of stuff. And so I have these, a couple of companies and the hardest, the thing I don't like is trying to make all the decisions in the, right. yes. in the company. And I was like, oh, like when, when you said that, I was like, oh man, that was just, it was like a, a rock just fell off my shoulder. So yeah, thank you for I'm, that. Um, you're welcome. I mean, I'm glad it resonated and obviously it's all, I'm glad you bring it up for, for two reasons. One, it feels good to know that it hit home for you. Second is um, it's a good reminder that all the things that I'm saying right now, it's not just me proselytizing, wait, wagging my finger at folks and telling them to be different. It's all stuff learned from difficult experience. I mean, as you remember from the book, that was a time in my life where I'd contemplated suicide yeah. um, because the math of my life didn't add up. I was running one of the most respected companies in the field. I was doing, our team was doing amazing work that I was incredibly proud of. I was making all the money someone could want. Um, and every day when I got to work and I put my fingers on the keyboard, I didn't like what I was doing, you know, and it, and we had just had our third child. So we were sleep deprived. So there's probably part of that as well. Um, <laughs> But my life didn't make any sense to me. You know, I'm like all the things that anyone in the world could want. Uh, supportive, um, partner, wonderful children, m getting paid to do the work that they love, being proud of the actual work, you know, being well respected and regarded. Everything was there. But I had stopped using my unique abilities and I had already tasted the sweetness of that fruit. The beginnings of right. this company were me doing unique ability work. That's the only reason it became successful in the first place. And in my mind, as I was reading like entrepreneur magazines and, you know, trying to trying to level myself up, I was being exposed to individuals that told me this was the leveling up you need to do. Right. This wasn't just uh, me learning from bad thinkers. This was me learning from the most respected thinkers I get it. and and the message that I was getting or at least you know maybe they weren't saying it but it was how my interpretation of it was that I need to learn to be an executive as the company grows I continue to float on top of it 
as, you know, first I'm the doer of all things with my partner, then I'm the manager of the people who are doing the things, then I have to manage the managers of the people who do the things, and that's where you become executive. And then, you know, if you ever get outside investment or new business partners, then you have to be a board member who interacts with the people who are then going to tell the executives what to tell the managers what to tell the people to do and you have to keep floating along that and that is the growth path right it's it's um the staircase you climb you know and there's a little piece of cheese on top of each staircase and that might be money or respect or regard or whatever and you have to like get up to the next the next step and get the cheese you know and um it made me so miserable that when i wrote down some of my suicidal thoughts in my notebook, which, you know, I, I talk about all these notebooks I have. I got one right here. This is the same kind of notebook I've been using for a decade. Um, for those uh, not watching, it's just a marble, one of those marble notebooks um, that I just write everything in, even while I'm doing podcasts. So I don't forget thoughts, you know, that occur to me. Um, when I wrote down that, hey, I was thinking of taking my, my own life, I was like, this is serious. I'm going to do something about this. I see your notebook there too. You're a notebooker. Um, <laughs> And uh, so that, uh, it was just a huge wake up call. And again, so this isn't me being like, theoretically, you ought to consider this. I'm like, hey, this could happen in your life, right? It's why, it, it's what actually precipitated all the exercises that led us to develop the values, purpose, and unique abilities work that we did with our team, right? Because at that time, I didn't have a concept of the unique abilities idea, which has come to mean at Precision Nutrition and now beyond, you know, um, what, uh, the, so you, your unique abilities will be the things that you are or have the ability to become world-class at that you enjoy doing and can see doing for the rest of your life. Cause there's stuff that you could be great at or are great at that you don't enjoy that much. So it's the stuff that accomplishes both of these check boxes. And then last is when you do it, it makes a difference on your metrics of meaning. Right. So unique abilities are the things that check all three boxes at the same time. It. You can be world class at or are you love doing and want to get better at for the rest of your life. And that actually makes a difference. So if you're in marketing, it helps you reach more people. If you're in sales, it helps you close more deals. If you're creating content, it helps you write more meaningful content that can impact more lives. You know, if you're coaching clients, you know, it means that when you do this stuff, people's lives are changed. You know, they lose weight or develop a better relationship with food or whatever you're working toward. So that's unique abilities work. And so first, Phil and I, went, my co-founder, went through all those exercises and figured out what they were. You know, and for those listening in, how do you do that? Well, in the book, there's a series of questions that you'll ask of 10 people who are friends, family, colleagues, etc. So the people who know you best, the people you rely on for honest feedback and the people who rely on you. And, you know, the questions aren't like, you know, what work should I do? But it's like, what am I good at? What gets me fired up? What do you count on me for? There's just a series of questions and you just reach out to all these people, you get their input and then you collate it. You know, you figure out where the common themes are. And it's, it's an amazing process. People who haven't gone through it can't possibly appreciate how good it'll make you feel because it's basically this little party for you, you know, where everyone gets to tell you what's good about you instead of, you know, constructive criticism, as you know, is uh, something that I tell people to learn to crave and want desperately. Yes. Uh, because it's the only way to make improvements in your life. Uh, this is a reprieve from that. This is your, you know, 10 minutes to just be like, I love fee constructive feedback. Tell me what's broken and what I need to do better. But time out on all that. Tell me why I'm awesome, right? And then you go through this process and it's so illuminating because you'll be like, all right, maybe I should make high protein bread, you know, or whatever, right? Um, and uh, I just, I, I think it's such an important exercise. It changed my life. What ended up happening is I came up with this list of my unique abilities and I posted on the wall right next to my computer. So every day when I wake up and I forget what I ought to be doing, what I'm world class at, what makes a difference and what I love, I can look at it and go, oh yeah, that's right, I forgot. You know, and it sounds so absurd that once you discover the truth of yourself that you need to be reminded every morning, 
but you do. you do. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's wish that it were not so, but you do. It's it's your teeth get dirty from a day of living and eating. So you brush them every morning. Your mind gets cloudy from a day of distractions and stressors and whatever. So you got to clean it up every morning, know what you ought to be working on. So that's, mm. that's, uh, you know, if folks take anything from this book and there's so much I, that I love about it, um, that section on career, that intersection of, you know, what's your origin story? How does that lead to your purpose? How can you serve your purpose with your unique abilities? And then how can you put guardrails around that work with your value system um, is, I think, the most impactful part of the book uh, for, for anyone at any stage of their career. It is as powerful. And since you brought it up, uh, how you approached criticism or feedback, how you mm-hmm. approach feedback was really good. And to, to sum it up, I would say it would, it would be don't take it personal, mm-hmm. but be curious about it and and start seeking it out so and and be yeah. curious about it so that it can actually help you learn and grow from it totally yeah that's a good synopsis you know and, and the only other thing i would say is that um there's levels of evolution here right the first level is get good at tolerating feedback right yeah because <laughs> most people can't tolerate it right but that's not the ultimate place that's where most people stop They're like, okay, I can tolerate people telling me about myself, right? Especially the negative things. The most successful people evolve well beyond that. They desperately need it. They want it. They get giddy when someone's about to tell them something negative about themselves. Um, Even if that person is an a-hole and are wrong, they still are giddy because they now have information that they can filter right? True or false, right? You get to decide. That's the best part about feedback. You don't, you, there's no implication that you have to do anything with it. Right. All you need to do is shut up and receive it and then get out your notebook and figure out what feedback you got this day or this week was accurate. And if it's accurate, then it's a real depiction of the world and your life should be trying to figure out how the world really is. So you can operate authentically and truly in the world that really is, Mm -hmm. you know, so it just becomes this for me now it's desperate for feedback. I'm like hiding in the bushes around people's outside people's houses, jumping up being like, tell me what's wrong with myself, you know, please, because I can't get better unless I'm getting an accurate depiction of who I am, what I'm doing. Now, does it always feel great the exact second that someone tells it to you? (laughs) No. Right. But this is a skill that you develop. Eventually, with enough practice, you can regulate your heart rate, regulate your catecholamine response. Epinephrine doesn't go up. Norepinephrine doesn't release. You just go, oh, someone's about to tell me something cool, you know, cool. And if they tell you something really obnoxious and mean, You go, oh, well, that's easy to dismiss. It's simply not true. And, you know, again, we have four young children. This is an exercise we practice on a daily basis. Oh, that's so important. Um, When uh, my daughter, who's 10, runs up and says that her brother, who's eight, called her ugly and stupid, (laughs) um, I just say, but neither of those is true. And she's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Well, he was just being mean then. Yeah, but that's okay because that passes, right? He's, well, you guys will be best buddies in like 10 minutes. And she's like, yeah, you're right. Okay, cool. So this is the, wow. the drill we go. You know, someone said this bad about me. Is it true? No. Okay, then it doesn't have any power to affect you in a negative way, does it? No. Is it true? Yes. Okay, cool. Let's spend some time on that then. Is it how you want to be? No. Okay, then how can we work on that? What's a strategy we can work on that? You know, so it's just, I I want this to be a thing that our kids have a mastery of because there are so many adults walking around in the world who've never been given the gift of understanding what feedback really is and how it can support your life, you know? So I, I think it's so important. And part of, again, my own strategy for coming to terms with it, because I wasn't always good at this and I wasn't given these strategies when I was young, um, 
is that every time someone's about to give me feedback, even if I'm like, oh, here it comes, I go, oh, this is a chance to practice, right? Difficult conversations I write about in the book. Crucial Conversations is one of my all-time favorite books because it taught me how to embrace the challenge of difficult interactions with people. It's a very and, good book. Uh, that's a that's another great example of this exact thing this practice idea you know when a difficult conversation is coming up i can start feeling the dread like what if this goes badly or whatever but i also know that difficult conversations aren't every day in my life they come too infrequently to get good at them right unless i see each one as a good practicing exercise, right? So when there's a chance for a difficult conversation, I'm like, awesome, these don't come frequently enough. I need to learn, I need to be better at this. So bring it on, you know? And I feel the same way about negative feedback. You know, it's this, it's, it's, you could call it a reframe, but that just implies it's an intellectual exercise. It's, it's not, it's like, it is a practice. You know, and practices are the things that build skills and skills yes. is what gets you to your goals. Right. So um, I feel real strongly about both of these things. And uh, most people are cowering away from them. Uh, and I get why I did, too, for much of my life. Um, there is another way to be. There's a way to not just tolerate difficult conversations and negative feedback. There's a way to really want them. And part of that is just simply, gosh, if I'm going to be better at these Everyone that comes up is a precious chance, you know? That alone is life-changing if somebody can grab hold of that. That is, that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's, you know, actually, uh, the guy that I hired to be the editor-in-chief, we had a meeting two weeks ago, and he, he's got a 11, 12-year-old, and he's working on this with her. And so one of the little things that I'm hobbying at right now is writing children's books with our family and so um he was so excited about this idea that i was like oh that's got to be my next one so i'm actually working on this as a children's book right now um and then one day it's going to end up in a university for to help people become better parents <laughs> so, there you go <laughs> hey listen do you have time for one more question i do absolutely so i wrote this down and i I'm going to try to read my writing. Um, your purpose statement for you that you hung above your door is, when I die or retire, I'd like to know that my work made a tangible difference in helping health and fitness changers uh, see their clients differently, see themselves differently, and see their work differently. That's your purpose. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to ask you about, you, you, you started out with when I die or retire. Mm -hmm. But I would just like to ask you, do you think you'll really have to wait till you <laughs> retire or you die before you realize that you have fulfilled your purpose? Uh, no, I, d I don't think so. This, this particular question, which for folks who end up picking up the book is engraved in the actual cover of the book. So there's like a dust jacket, as people know, you know, that flappy thing that's always annoying. Uh, and under there, when I die or retire, you know, this, th this idea is, is engraved, not my purpose, but this idea of asking you to find yours, uh, will I know that my work has mattered kind of a thing. Uh, it came from a conversation I had with a really remarkable person many years ago. So we went to graduate school together. Um, she ended up, we did our PhDs together, and then she ended up going and doing an MD in a highly specialized field of medicine. So she went and did med school and then did like eight more years of training. Uh, she also won two Olympic medals during that time in rowing. Um, it's just a, a, just an incredible ass kicking human being. She's an MD PhD with, you know, two gold medals at the Olympics. Um, and you know, she's, uh, just started getting down to the business of her career well after I did, right. Because I finished up, I, I started mine during my PhD work and she was going off and doing med school and all this other stuff. And so we were just talking about how to leverage what, her knowledge uh, toward her passions. And she in particular it, is, is doing the right thing. She's like, I got a PhD, I've got an MD and physical activity is super important to me. So exercise as medicine is a big part of what she wants to do with her life, right? So somehow work towards changing the use of 
exercise, physical activity, movement, and its relationship to what happens in medicine, you know? And um, it's a huge goal. It's a noble, huge goal. And she has all the credibility to be able to go make change in that space. You know what I mean? Like you, there are some things that credibility requires, right? You can't just be a personal trainer and do that. You need to have an MD. You need to be one of them. And you also, having a PhD, know the research. So you can really dig into that aspect of it. And then again, she's a world famous exerciser. You know what I mean? Right. So she has all the credibility indicators. And I just remember sitting there talking with her. And, and a question that I asked her was, um, when you die or retire, and this is the first time I ever said it in this way, when you die or retire, will you be okay knowing that you've started the snowball rolling, but it's not really changed anything? You know, so you, you can work until the end of your life, and the industry of medicine is way too slow moving and changing for you to really see the fruit of your efforts. If that's okay to you, then awesome. You know, this is the right path. If it's not okay, this will be a sad life, right? Like you'll be at death or retirement mm -hmm. going, I worked really hard and it hasn't changed, mm. you know? And so it was just a really fun, deep, important conversation. And it just struck me as, as I walked away, I'm like, that was a, that was a damn good question I asked her, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, and then I, th then I was like, I ought to ask myself that question, <laughs> you know, cause again, it, I, this wasn't like this deep wisdom I've been practicing for years. It, it only occurred to me in that conversation. And so then, then that's when I asked myself that question. And then that's when it became a fundamental pillar of this book, which is this exact idea you know, for everyone who reads it, um, we, if you can afford this book, if you're working in health and fitness, if you can listen to our podcast, you are part of the group of people that are blessed enough to be able to ask that question in the first place and then able to go out and meaningfully try and answer it. When I die or retire, will what I have done mattered for me? right? You don't have to be a world changer or whatever Steve Jobs said, make a dent in the universe as if there was such a possibility by a human. Um, you, you simply have to know that for me, it was worth it, you know, whoever me is, right? And so I think uh, it's just a critical governing question, right? It challenges you to be aspirational, realistic, to gather a deep sense of self, uh, to know what will be important to you. You know, it's kind of like when people say, what do you want your eulogy to be? That's kind of this exercise on the personal side, right? On the professional side, we ought to do it too. You know, not necessarily what legacy will I leave behind, but will I have done the stuff that was meaningful to me, however I define meaning. So I always challenge people to do it. And I, I think that, uh, it's just amazing that we have the opportunity to do this. You know, I think that the resources are out there to figure out how to actually do it and that it would be one of each individual listener's greatest life tragedies uh, to not pursue that. When I die or retire, it will have mattered, you know? So that's, that's why it's engraved in the cover of the book. That's why it's a question I ask all people to ask themselves. And it's, and it's why I share mine, you know, I'm like, Hey, this is, I, it's written, this one's posted right next to my unique abilities on the wall, you know, because I want to remember it every day that it's, it's a call, you know, uh, some people do this memento mori thing. Uh, for those who don't know, they it's, it's memento mori loosely translated from Latin is remember your death or remember that the end or remember that you'll die. And uh, so what they do is they assume an average life of 76 to 80 years. And then each week of their life gets a box and they put a big calendar on the wall. And then they just, at the end of each week, they cross it out, right? So for their lifetime, they watch as the sands of the hourglass, you know, escape, right? So this is how much I've lived. This is how much I have to go. Um, 
I think it's interesting. You know, it's, I, I'm actually writing a piece about this. I think there's another orientation you can have rather than me memento mori. There's uh, another conceptualization, uh, memento vita, like remember that you live also, right, yeah. you know what I mean? Remember life. Um, and so this to me is, is some, strikes some something of the balance between the two, you know? Um, it's kind of like a memento mori, cal mori calendar for me. I think that's powerful. And I don't know if everyone, I think inside everyone, they want to know that their life counts, that mm -hmm. they made a difference. Like they may not actually know what it, but there's a churning in, inside of people that sometimes makes them restless. And mm -hmm. I think it's just that they want their life to count and they want mm -hmm. to, even if it is just for themselves, but they're, they have this, this pull to, to be, and to mm -hmm. be what they're supposed to be or who they're supposed to be. Yes. They just don't necessarily always know what it is. That's that, that churning. Yeah. I mean, I have a saying that I often, um, use, which is, um, uh, the stuff that we're doing while we're waiting to die. Right. So, I mean, essentially that's what life is at the most basic level, right? We know we're going to die someday. We're waiting for that to happen, right? And we got loads of time between now and then, or not. There's certainly some time, you know what I mean? Because right. it hasn't happened yet. Um, and so if we dive natural causes, it's probably a load of time for a bunch of us. So life is essentially the stuff that we're doing to fill in that time. Now you could waste it. You can do a bunch of meaningless stuff, um, or you can do a bunch of meaningful things. You're the one who gets to decide the meaning because once you're gone, the chances that any of it really means anything to the broader universe is negligent, negligible, you know? So uh, it's kind of up to you to, to do the definitions and stuff, you know? Um, for some people I've talked to, they're like, wow, this doesn't inspire me at all. Just a bunch of stuff you're doing. So it doesn't matter what you do, right? For other people, it's very inspiring, right? You're like, I get to architect. Yes. Whatever stuff I do, you know what I mean? I can. And, and the notion that somehow um, it's all going to be meaningful or all going to be worthless is silly, right? How much stuff do you do every day? You know, so you're going to do some meaningless stuff and some meaningful stuff. I think, as you say, there's some desire for us to at least spend some of the time that we're you know, spending while waiting to die on meaningful stuff, you know? Yes. And, uh, so that's, that's how I often think about it. You know, it's, it's often how I get myself motivated sometimes, you know, we're doing our little homeschooling thing here. And some days I'm like, all right, cool. You know, what else will I do? That's like in line with my unique abilities, values, and purpose. You know, is, is this it? Is raising these four children to be, I don't know, responsible into adulthood it period, you know? Or is there more? And, and, you know, it changes all the time, right? COVID sort of brought us into this situation here. And so we're here in this and we, we wouldn't have expected this. Actually, it was such an interesting turn of events because our youngest, who's four, uh, started school last January. So it was like, uh, you know, we, had, we have always had uh, infant or toddler at home for over 10 years. And this is our first, like, uh -huh. yes, all four are going to school. It's amazing. Now we can pursue some other things. Uh, and then, like, three months later, the opposite happened, and they were all home. You know, it went from, yay, all the kids are at school, to, whoa, none of the kids are at school now, you know? So even if – so everything has a season, mm -hmm. and seasons come and go. Like, so the COVID season, even if all you did – and this is just an if – if all you did was help your four children through school in a day, that's beautiful. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. I mean, you know, especially you're teaching them how to, how to handle feedback and how, I mean, you're teaching them how to think, how to learn, how mm -hmm. to grow. Yeah. So it's an opportunity really. Yes. But, and if that's all you did though, at some point that's also enough, mm -hmm. but, but I have a sense that you'll, you'll end up doing more. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, 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 this is my nature. I constantly think about these things, right? I'm like, it, you know, this, this is a thing of meaning. Um, yet, you know, part of my conceptualization of 
a meaningful life is doing things that are within your unique ability set, right? So I'm like, ah, I'm scratching at the unique ability stuff with yes. this homeschooling stuff, but it's not fully in that sweet spot of my unique right. abilities, right? So it's like, cool. Uh, if I do any other projects, it would have to satisfy that. And and I may or may not have another project that satisfies that coming down the line in the next few months. <laughs> I, uh, I'm working on a deal right now to do something pretty cool, maybe in January that, you know, maybe takes 15 hours a week, but is right in that perfect zone of, you know, my own unique abilities. So, you know, and again, it's, it's, you know, I'm in this really fortunate spot in my life where I can ask the world for exactly what I want. It can say no, and, and it has, you know, but uh, this particular project, I'm like, hey, I want to do this thing. I'm going to keep it cryptic. Uh, I want to do this thing. And usually to do this thing, it takes about 15 rolls. And I only want to do two of them. You know, I, the rest of them are not my unique abilities. I don't have fun doing them. So I'm just going to ask the world, will you give me the ability to just do these two things and then fill in the rest, you know, and see if anyone takes me up on that. So it looks like someone's going to take me up on that. So it's it's perfect because even, you know, during my time at PN, you know, as I talk about in the book, once you identify your unique abilities, you have to figure out how many hours a week or what percentage of your time is spent in them. And in the beginning, in an entrepreneurial venture, it's too little, right? You're doing all the things, not just your unique ability stuff. But for me, as things got worse in my, you know, relationship to work, it almost dwindled down to zero, you know, where I was doing like no unique ability work. And, um, then as we were, then I, as I figured that out, I put myself in the right position in the company, put other people in the right position, you know, it started to come back up, but really the best you can hope for in that scenario is like 70, 80% of your time spent in unique ability work. If you can do that, you're rocking it. Well, now at this point in my life, I'm like, what about a hundred? <laughs> can I get a hundred? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if I'm doing something professional, can I get a hundred percent unique ability work? Um, I'm going to ask. And if the universe says no, then I just won't do it, you know? So again, really unique position to be in. It's an extreme. It's not necessarily something I say everyone ought to aspire toward. Um, but for me, it's the place that I'm in right now. So maybe I'll, I'll ask you now just to marinate on it. Maybe a second interview sometime in January, February, just to follow up and see. There you go. I think that I think if... <laughs> I think that would be the perfect thing based on the project that I'm I'm doing. All right. That sounds yeah. wonderful. I mean, so let's keep in touch about that and, and we can chat about it more later and I can be less annoying. Uh, our, we, we actually have a surprise right after you and I get off this call for the kids and they know there's a surprise coming, but uh, they don't know what it is. So they're out there just absolutely dying. That's and exciting. It's one of the things I take great joy in, like getting people excited about stuff and then being like, but I'm not going to tell you about it till it's ready, you know, until we can all get excited together. <laughs> so because your, your children are excited, I don't want to keep you any longer. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much for your time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are in the health and fitness industry, get the book, The Changemaker. If you're not in the health and fitness industry, get the book, The Changemaker. It is very valuable, can help you discover your true purpose, who you are, can help point you in a good direction uh, just to give you a, a place to stand so that you don't waste your passion. Dr. John Berardi, thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thanks for having me, Tim. I really appreciate the conversation today. I really enjoyed it. Everyone who's listened so far, thanks for being with us all this time. Uh, I know your time is valuable, so spending with us, with us is special, so thanks. <laughs>